Wacky Icarus of Myths and Monsters is a kid Sisyphus simulator developed by Nintendo and released in 1991 for the Game Boy. We're going from a game where we had a pretty detailed picture of the development to one with very little information in that regard. There's no credits in the manual or staff role in the game, so even getting a complete list of names of people who worked on it has proven elusive. Any further context or details have been lost to time, which is unfortunately the case with a lot of Game Boy games. So, unfortunately, I can't regale you with another harrowing tale of uncompromising artists who worked relentlessly despite the oppressive constraints of their rigid corporate management. We just don't know any of those details. We do know that the game was developed in Japan as a first-party title, but only released in the US and Europe, and so Japanese audiences didn't really even know it existed until 2012, where it was put up on the 3DS eShop in anticipation for Kid Icarus Uprising. We can also imagine development wasn't quite as harsh as before since this new installment feels much more polished and complete. But before we jump into gameplay, let's talk narrative. The story is even more simple than it was last time. Palutena has a dream that one day Angel Land will be attacked by a demon named Orkos, so she calls for Pit and tells him to train through the Three Realms in order to gain enough power to use the Three Sacred Treasures and face Orkos. Or, THE Orkos, according to the manual. Now, you're probably wondering, didn't we already prove ourselves worthy of the Sacred Treasures when we literally just did that in the first game and even used them to defeat Medusa? And you're right, Pit even got turned into a big hunky man and got a smooch on the cheek as a reward. But you see, the thing you're forgetting is that Palutena obviously prefers SS, and decided to nerf Pit back into a twink, so now we gotta do it all over again. Yeah, it's all just an excuse to reuse the same level progression formula as the first game, so whatever. The primary goal for Myths and Monsters was to take the pretty straightforward and familiar Kid Icarus formula and just make it work on a Game Boy. So the story was very much a secondary afterthought. Considering the bare-bones simplicity that Kid Icarus already is, it should be no surprise that this transition could be made quite easily without the need for drastic change. Kid Icarus already had an episodic level structure, so introducing a battery-based save system at the end of every level made it feel right at home in the pick-up-and-play environment of the Game Boy. Not only that, but there have been tremendous strides in giving the gameplay a more tailor-made fit to feel more refined and easier to approach than its somewhat more hardcore predecessor. The most obvious change being the camera, which now follows the player no matter where they go, thus allowing you to ascend and descend through the levels with impunity and not worrying about the encroaching deadly abyss that is the bottom of the raster, which consequently makes the feather item near useless. When you pause the game, you can even move the camera around to get a look at the surrounding area. The controls feel more responsive than ever on both the ground and on air. You practically glide through the levels now, sometimes even literally since you can tap on the A button to flap your wings and slow down your descent, which is especially useful seeing as you can't always see what's below you thanks to the smaller zoomed in view. In order to preserve some of the difficulty, environmental hazards are made more common from poison pools to these thorny things, so even if you've got the firepower to shred through enemies, you've still got to be mindful of avoiding damage from the environment. Maneuvering through the cleverly designed levels has been made less brainless compared to the first game, and requires you to think more and more about your movement as the game progresses. Most of the basic design from the first game is carried over from the original, so you've got all the same staples of the first game with a few small changes like the additional hint rooms that can give you a clue to some secrets hidden within the level. Further conveniences were added, like centenarian statues being present in all the levels, and now being health repositories, or sometimes a map, rather than the useless fodder to be fed to bosses. Heck, even normal enemies can occasionally drop health now. You can cycle through the stock of shop items by pressing the down button, making it way easier to buy more than one of something. There's also a new key item, which allows you to re-enter any door you've already entered before, which can be really nice if you find a power upgrade room, but don't quite have high enough score yet. The added implementation of lives is somewhat questionable to me, especially since, to my knowledge, there's no way to increase them. Maybe it's a score thing, but it hardly matters since if you die, there's very little to stop you from just restarting your system and continuing from the last save anyway. Most tragically, this results in the absence of the iconic I'm finished screen, and replaces it with a bizarre animation of Pit floating off to heaven. He's already an angel, and this seems like an upgrade because now he can fly. In my head, as soon as Palutena sees him, she immediately clips his wings and slam dunks him through his own halo back down to where he was. Anyway, apart from the new camera system, upgrades have probably seen the most dramatic change. It's still the same three upgrades, but there are added limitations. Each upgrade now requires a certain amount of health to be active. The flame requires two health bars to be filled, the long shot requires three health bars, and the rotating orbs require four. So there's a built-in order that you should acquire them, which prevents you from becoming too overpowered too quickly, like you could before. Unfortunately, you won't know the requirements beforehand, so if you try to grab the magic wand first, you'll find that it won't even become active until much later in the game, and you probably should have picked the flame instead because that could actually be of immediate use. As you lose health, your upgrades start to go away, which adds a nice bit of fluctuating challenge. Having all the upgrades makes you incredibly powerful, but if you're too reckless, you'll gradually lose them, and need to play much more carefully. Since hot springs have been made more common at the start of the game and less common towards the end, this pairs extraordinarily well with how useful having as full a health bar as possible is, thanks to the predetermined access to each upgrade, and also how difficult it is to actually stay at high health. 
In short, having all the upgrades doesn't instantly trivialize the rest of the game, and motivates you to play more intelligently and less recklessly, so that you can hold on to your upgrades. And finding those rarer hot springs towards the end of the game will be all the more rewarding if you find yourself low on health. This benefit makes itself even more apparent since you can also use any upgrades you have within fortresses. Fortresses as a whole are more or less carbon copies of how they appeared in the first game, a maze of rooms with a boss at the end, and the maps you can find are also just as useless. One delightful change, however, is that the effect of the eggplant spell actually shrinks you down, allowing you to fit through paths you wouldn't ordinarily be able to. This means they had to remove the crouching scuttle from the first game, but that was never really any use to begin with, so that's fine by me. Anyway, the medical rooms are always placed nearby the routes only accessible as an eggplant, so you won't have to wander around aimlessly for too long. Apart from that, the only other change worth mentioning is that bosses lack any indication of their remaining health. But thanks to a quirk in the shooting mechanics, you're able to fire an arrow immediately after the preceding one disappears. So if you stand next to a boss and rapid fire the B button, you can really deliver some serious pain in short order. But once you've finished the final fortress, you'll have earned enough good boy points for Palutena to hand over the three sacred treasures. And just in time too, as it turns out her hunch was right and the king of the evil land, Orcos, shows up to turn Palutena to stone, I think, and steal her away. One more, fairly short, horizontally scrolling level plays out where you have a chance to test out your new gear. Your arrows now continue through enemies, your wings let you fly indefinitely, and the armor... looks nice, I guess. Throughout the level, you can visit a whole bunch of rooms to catch up on upgrades, but you'll still want to tread carefully through the treacherous terrain and myriad new enemies as you prepare for the final boss. The final battle with Orcos isn't remarkably complicated, but it's pretty neat to have a mostly mid-air battle where you're in control of your flight. And it's a lot more interesting compared to the legendary Remain Stationary and Mash the B button battle with Medusa's face. Once you take him out, he'll assume his final form, which I gotta say is pretty impressive both visually and gameplay-wise, given the limited capabilities of the Game Boy. It really delivers that endgame surprise that the previous game did so well, and makes for a satisfying final challenge. Mechanically, it's still nothing mind-blowing. You dodge his attacks, which occur in regular sequence, and shoot his face as much as you can when it pops out. That said, this fight isn't a cakewalk, and requires a decent amount of concentration and timing to avoid all of his attacks and position yourself to strike back, especially if the preceding level managed to whittle down your health before you even got here. As far as Game Boy boss fights go, this is one of the more impressive ones in terms of quality and challenge, and I'm already drafting a petition to get Orcos added to Smash. Anyway, deliver enough damage and Orcos is history. Palutena freed, and Angel Land saved. Pit begins to fly up through the air in what should have been a credit sequence, but is instead just a showcase of all the enemies, before flying a little too close to the sun, and... Yep, this is me. You're probably wondering how I got here. Well, it all started way back when I... This game is occasionally discredited for being a little too similar to the first game with just a bit of extra polish. A lazy sequel that rehashes the old game and doesn't take any risks of its own. But the enhancements to gameplay and difficulty balancing are quite substantial improvements that elevate the core experience of the original to show off just how good it could have been and lifts the game beyond being a mere cash grab adaptation of the NES game in my eyes. Sure, it's not reinventing the series or pushing boundaries in any way, but the original was in desperate need of some further refinement, and this game delivered that in a delightful handheld rendition of the classic experience. However, because the game is so smooth and polished now, it might just slip right out of your memory as soon as you put it down. It might be technically better than the original in just about every way, but it doesn't leave as much of an impression. The original game was quirky, and its difficulty made overcoming its challenges more compelling. Eminem's comparative lack of difficulty makes it feel less engaging in some ways. And I also think it's missing some of the original's charm. It doesn't help that they got rid of Specknose, and the Reaper theme isn't quite as good this time around either. It just goes to show that sometimes when you get exactly what you want, it's not quite what you thought it would be. But, in spite of all that, I wouldn't go out and say that Myths and Monsters doesn't need to exist, because it's still a really good game that offers a clean and enjoyable way to experience the Kid Icarus formula that I can easily recommend to anyone, whereas recommending the original would require a few asterisks. Suffice to say, this game has been made much easier and streamlined in a manner that greatly suits a more casual handheld rendition of the original. But now, I mean, where do you go from here? Sure, these games are fun and all, but they're much more arcade-like than your typical home console game, meaning they're not as substantial and memorable as, say, your typical Legend of Zelda or Metroid-style adventures. Much like your Ice Climbers and Wrecking Crews, the Kid Icarus games are enjoyable, but don't quite cross the barrier of being impactful enough to propel a whole series. You can polish it up, and that's just dandy, but if you can't find a way to innovate, you won't make it very far. Which is why the Kid Icarus series effectively died here. And so it remained for about 21 years. And now for real, in the next video, We'll see where Masahiro Sakurai thought he could take the series in its revival for the 3DS. I'll see you there.